Rocket Lab unveiled new details of the design of its Neutron Medium Class rocket, a vehicle with a unique design the company says is intended to enable frequent and low cost reuse. Rocket Lab already has a rocket called Electron, which the company has been launching to orbit since 2017. Electron is meant to carry relatively small satellites into low Earth orbit to capitalize on the small satellite revolution. But in March, Rocket Lab announced its intention to build another bigger rocket called Neutron. The two stage Neutron launch vehicle made of carbon composite materials will stand at 40 meters tall, towering much higher than Electron, which is just 18 meters tall. The vehicle is 7 meters wide at its base and gradually tapers. That design intended to reduce heat loads on the vehicle during re-entry, before landing back at the launch site. Propelled by seven main engines called Archimedes, the rocket will be capable of putting between 8 and 15 tons into low Earth orbit. The engine uses methane and liquid oxygen propellants and generates about 7,530 kilonewtons of thrust at liftoff. Rather than jettison the rocket's payload fairing during launch, the fairing opens in four parts. Neutron then releases a lightweight, expendable upper stage with the payload before the fairing closes and the stage re-enters. Instead of landing legs that unfold, Neutron will have a static base with no mechanisms in place. The rocket will have shock absorbers built into that base for the impact of landing. The only part of Neutron that is not reusable is the upper stage. The lightweight upper stage is powered by an Archimedes engine that delivers 1,110 kilonewtons of thrust. The Neutron update given by Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck had plenty of subtle digs at SpaceX. Rocket Lab does not intend to land Neutron on drone ships in the ocean, like SpaceX does most of the time. Instead, the first stage will return to Earth to land right back on its launch pad. Furthermore, the integrated fairing design appears to be a direct response to SpaceX's years-long attempt to catch the rocket's fairings using large nets tied to boats. While SpaceX was successful in catching the fairings a few times, the firm eventually abandoned the project due to low reliability. Another nod to SpaceX came when Beck discussed the material from which Neutron would be made. Beck criticized stainless steel, the primary material used by SpaceX to construct its new Starship rocket. On the other hand, Neutron will be made of a special carbon composite material developed by Rocket Lab, which the company claims is more durable. Rocket Lab claims the vehicle will be perfect for launching medium-sized satellites that are part of proposed megaconstellations. However, Beck envisions other opportunities for Neutron, such as human space flights, and even interplanetary flights. Rocket Lab is targeting to get Neutron on the launch pad by 2024, and hopes to launch a commercial customer on the rocket by 2025. On November 30, the Office of Audits at NASA has released a report outlining the agency's commitment to replace the International Space Station with one or more private space stations once the orbiting laboratory is decommissioned. Despite the fact that the ISS's operational life is still set for 2024, all indications are that it will be extended to 2030. This audit primarily outlines the present costs of maintaining and operating the station, as well as why it thinks that there will still be an essential need for a research facility that can provide a test bed for prolonged human exposure to space. Astronauts have lived and worked on board the ISS for more than 20 years. The space station costs about $3 billion a year, roughly a third of NASA's annual human space flight budget, the U.S. Space Agency said in the audit report. The audit concludes that NASA intends to have a commercial station operational by 2028, allowing for a two-year gap before the ISS is expected to be retired. On December 2, just two days after the release of the report, NASA has awarded $415 million in agreements to three companies to further develop private station plans. The three companies, which received the awards under the agency's commercial Low Earth Orbit Destinations program are NanoRacks, Blue Origin and Northrop Grumman. The three firms have already released a handful of details about their proposals. Blue Origin's station concept is dubbed Orbital Reef, and it is being developed in collaboration with Boeing, Sierra Space, and others. The team has stated that the station will be launched in 2027. Meanwhile, Nanorax has dubbed their station Starlab, which is being created in collaboration with its parent company Voyager Space and aerospace giant Lockheed Martin. Starlab is also slated to launch in 2027. While Northrop hasn't given its proposed station a catchy name, it is collaborating with Dynetics on a modular architecture based on its Cygnus spacecraft. The hope is to get at least one of the company's concepts in orbit before 2030. NASA does not expect to foot the entire bill for helping companies build new space stations, with the agency saying the strategy has to work for both the government and the private sector from an investment perspective.
Notably absent is Axiom Space, which won a separate award to send up modules to attach to the ISS before separating and self-orbiting as its own station, but the company clarified that it did not bid on the commercial Low Earth Orbit Destinations program. During a six-and-a-half-hour spacewalk on Thursday, NASA astronauts Thomas Marshburn and Caleb Barron replaced a malfunctioning communications antenna and achieved other get-ahead tasks. NASA postponed the spacewalk initially scheduled for Tuesday until Thursday after receiving a space debris warning for the International Space Station. The astronauts left the hatch at 6.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time and successfully worked through all of their tasks. They replaced an S-band antenna subassembly by using a spare that has existed outside the station since 2010. Spacewalking astronauts Kayla Barron and Tom Marshburn have just finished retrieving the spare SASA from the Express Logistics carrier. The S-band radio frequencies are used to transmit low-rate voice and data from the space station to flight controllers on the ground. After being operational for 21 years, the antenna recently stopped sending signals to Earth. Overall, the loss of this antenna has a low impact on space station operations. However, maintaining antennas like this one allows for redundancy in communications. The spacewalk ended at 12.47 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with both the astronauts back in the hatch. Thursday's spacewalk was the 245th conducted to assemble, maintain, and upgrade the space station. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. After a successful six-engine Raptor static fire test on November 12, Starship 20 attempted its fourth static fire test on December 1. Two hours into the 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. test window on Wednesday, Starship 20 was already venting and starting to get frosty, indicating that propellant loading had begun. A little over an hour later, it was clear that SpaceX had aborted the static fire attempt of the day. During the next three hours, Ship 20 displayed some weird activity, including new vents, an apparent header tank pressurization or fill test, and even more strange venting in new spots. In the middle of Starship's static fire attempt, SpaceX began simultaneously loading the test tank known as Booster 2.1 with liquid nitrogen, marking the first simultaneous test of multiple Starship test articles. As Ship 20 aborted the static fire test and detanked the propellants, Booster 2.1 was fully loaded with liquid nitrogen and pressure tested not long after. A few hours later, the test tank was also detanked, marking the end of the pressure test. The test tank was pressure tested again on Thursday and Friday during the test windows. The liquid nitrogen used for the pressure testing was supplied from SpaceX's custom-built storage tanks, adding to the test's peculiarity. This is the first time the tank farm has been used for Starship tests of any kind. Reliable sources have recently confirmed that two liquid methane GSE tanks at the tank farm failed to obtain the required certifications for operation. So, the two horizontal tanks, which arrived at the launch site in October, will temporarily or permanently hold liquid methane required for Starship operations. Apart from the static fire attempt, Ship 20 tested its forward and aft flaps on Wednesday by stretching them. While minor relative to almost any other testing milestone, the test ensured that the flaps were in good condition and performing as expected. The thermal protection tile installation on Ship 20 is 99% complete, indicating that the prototype is nearing its first orbital test flight. GSE test tank number 4 was moved to a test location on the launch site last week, so it is likely to see the GSE test tank pressure test this week. Road closure for ground tests is scheduled from Monday to Thursday. The tests may involve the Ship 20's fourth static fire test, cryo test of test tanks, or both. On Friday, CEO Elon Musk announced on Twitter that SpaceX has begun building a launch pad for its Starship rockets in Florida, as the company looks to add another location to launch Starship. The new launch pad will be part of the existing Launch Complex 39A that SpaceX currently leases from NASA, where many of the company's Falcon 9 launches originate. Launch Complex 39A has historical significance because it is the exact location from where Apollo NASA astronauts lifted off atop the Saturn V rocket on a voyage to set foot on the lunar surface. Pad 39A also supported space shuttle missions up until its retirement in 2011. When SpaceX began Starship development two years ago, they started building rocket prototypes both near the NASA complex and in Boca Chica, Texas. However, the company later pivoted to focus on work at the Boca Chica site. SpaceX had previously started some work on a Starship-specific launch pad on the grounds of Launch Complex 39A. But, since builders have poured concrete for the foundation of the Starship pad in late 2019, the location has largely remained dormant. Musk's tweet on Friday marks the renewal of work on the Florida launch site.
Moreover, recent satellite imagery shows that SpaceX began dismantling the suborbital launch pad foundation at Pad 39A to replace it with an orbital launch pad. In a statement to CNBC, NASA confirmed that SpaceX is within the rights of their lease agreement to make launch infrastructure improvements within the boundaries of the pad. The agency also confirmed that NASA is not providing funding for the Starship launch pad and deferred to SpaceX on the project scope, cost, and timeline. The space agency performed an environmental assessment of the plan in 2019 and gave SpaceX permission to begin work within the LC-39A site. But the agency said that approval is only to build at this time, with authorization for launches and landings requiring a separate approval process. Musk's construction announcement also comes as SpaceX works to resolve a crisis with production of the Raptor engines that power Starship rockets. In a recent email to SpaceX employees, Musk described a dire situation, warning of a genuine risk of bankruptcy for SpaceX if the company is not flying Starship rockets regularly by the end of 2022. In a brief update on November 30, Musk tweeted that issues with the Raptor engines are getting fixed, but did not provide more details on the problem or solution. At Starbase, works on the Starship launch tower are progressing. The drawworks rope block was lifted a little recently, placing the cable under tension and closing the space between the shackle and the rope block. This indicates that the installation of the drawworks mechanism is nearing completion, and the catching arm will be lifted soon. The next-generation Starship nose cone, which was under construction inside the nose cone tent for months, was recently moved out of the tent. This cleaner nose cone produced with new manufacturing techniques will go on top of Starship 23. The booster quick disconnect arm shield, which will protect the QD arm and its sensitive components from the thousands degree plume created by Raptor engines at full thrust, was recently painted black at the build site. The hood will be mounted on the orbital launch mount soon. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.